Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining the Oak and Point webinar today. I am Jenny Chaplin and I am your host for today. I'm the principal of Sapphire Consulting and my areas of focus are program and alliance management as well as corporate operations. I work with startups in implementing their early stage planning and operations and providing guidance on their development pathways through IND and then into the clinic and even beyond. The Ocam Point webinar, we focus on showcasing startups and small businesses that are pioneering transformative solutions that, that are going to enhance the productivity and efficiency in the pharmaceutical and medical device space. I want to thank all of you very much for your ongoing support. We have Stat Forward, Telperion, Teleomics, and our feature sponsor for today, Clinical Research Strategies. I'd like to introduce my co-host, Alethea Weiland. Alethea is the president, COO, and co-founder of Clinical Research Strategies, delivering pragmatic risk mitigation strategies that are able to move clinical trials and clinical development forward in the most successful manner. Thank you, everyone. I am so proud of the uh, relationship and the collaboration that I've built with Sateri Williams. Sateri has over 20 years of global experience in health economics and outcomes research, medical affairs, medical communications, and publications. She's got very diverse track record with strategic planning to deliver robust evidence supporting product launches across a wide variety of therapeutic areas. She's got a PhD in chronic disease epidemiology and has held positions at AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Novartis, Radius Health. Thank you for the introduction, Alethea. We are going to talk about some of the challenges and alternatives to conducting randomized controlled trials, um, provide some of the regulatory perspective of the use of real world evidence for regulatory applications and talk about our case study. We have over 20 years of real-world evidence supporting value propositions for drugs, biologics, and devices. We specialize in planning, execution, and scientific communication of real-world evidence studies for various stakeholders. <clears throat> Several regulatory bodies around the world consider real-world evidence in their uh, drug approval process beyond safety monitoring and post-marketing assessments. The FDA actively supports the use of real-world evidence, especially following the 21st Century Cures Act that encourages its use in drug and device approvals. The evidence is everything that is generated outside of randomized controlled trials and readily available from administrative claims, uh, electronic health records, disease or drug registries, uh, or even patient surveys or focus groups. We want to share this case study with you. This is for abaloparatide, which is a synthetic analog of human parathyroid hormone-related peptide. And abaloparatide was second in class to teraparatide, which was approved by the FDA in 2002. In 2015, Radius submitted a application to MAA, and it was before submission of the NDA to the FDA. The FDA approved the drug in um, 2017, but EMA refused um, the application for approval. There was only one pivotal study, and the study was placebo-controlled with an open-label arm, so a comparison to teraparatide, which was the first drug in class. EMA did not accept data from two of the sites because they thought that uh, there were issues with good clinical practice. Data from those two sites were eliminated, rendering the primary endpoint non-significant. There were two evidence gaps, both for effectiveness and safety. The company could not do another randomized controlled trials or a placebo controlled study because we already knew that the drug works. It is really important to engage your audience early on before you execute your study at the design phase, making sure that the regulators are aligned with the way you are going to design your study, select your population, define your endpoints, you have to have a pre-specified hypothesis. 
We made it publicly available. We registered it at the FDA website. And so it was clear from the beginning, the objective of the study was to demonstrate non-inferiority to the only other drug approved in class in Europe. So we had to provide clear definition of the variables we matched, demonstrate that matching worked, that population of patients we were comparing were really comparable in terms of their probability of receiving and benefiting from treatment. And then we had to provide a list of study strengths and limitations and how we minimize biases associated with the data capture and endpoint assessment. We did follow the eSport guidelines, which are also referenced in the FDA guidance for conduct of real-world studies for regulatory approval. So the Symphony data that we used included electronic medical records, labs, and other data, and it's all payer agnostic, so it's across multiple payers in the U.S., and we'll use propensity score matching to make sure that the cohorts were comparable in their probability to receive and benefit from treatment. And we did use an extensive list of indicators for disease severity, as well as treatment history, as suggested by evidence-based guidelines. 11,000 patients for each of the cohorts, uh, which was 10 times more than it was included in the pivotal trial. We followed up patients for the same amount of time that they were followed in the pivotal study. We looked at women over 50 with one or more prescription for abaloparatide or teriparatide during this time window. The primary endpoint was time to first non-vertebral fracture. The secondary endpoint, it was time to first composite endpoint of major cardiovascular events. We were hypothesizing non-inferiority for abalo versus seropartide and time to first non-vertebral fracture. And we were able to demonstrate that. The secondary endpoint was also met. We were able to show there was comparable safety, which was time to first cardiovascular event. So we did meet the study objective. And in this type of studies to test the robustness of findings, often also have to do some subgroup and sensitivity analysis. Uh, we did a number of subgroup analysis and the results were consistent. In conclusion, the study does provide additional information on non-inferiority of abalo versus teriparatide. We did demonstrate that it was comparable in terms of prevention of non-vertebral fracture. It resulted in a 22% reduction in hip fractures and demonstrated similar cardiovascular safety, which was a concern for regulators. As with any study, there are always strengths and limitations. Uh, it is important when you do real-world evidence studies to know your data limitations and to um, develop your methodologies to address those limitations. We use propensity score matching to demonstrate that the two cohorts were comparable in their probability of receiving and benefiting from treatment. We did power calculation prior to the study execution, so we knew the study was powered for the design. We also wanted to make sure that the endpoints were validated. The endpoints here were not adjudicated as you would have in the clinical trials. We looked at a claims-based validated algorithm uh, to make sure that the osteoporotic-related fractures were indeed related to osteoporosis. Dr. Nicole Wright and uh, Jeff Curtis from the University of Alabama had previously developed and validated this algorithm we also use the FDA Sentinel guidance for coding of the cardiovascular events to make sure that they were indeed new events and not recurring events. Uh, we conducted sensitivity analysis to test the robustness of the finding. Those were all the strengths of the study that are also in detail outlined in the manuscript. And as for limitations, with the claims data, there are inherent limitations. For example, we don't have information on bone mineral density. We know that the patient filled the prescription, but we don't know whether or not they took it as directed. So we are using the fill of the prescription as a proxy for actual medication intake. RWE is one piece of the puzzle. 
So in um, the time that the FDA approved abalapatite in 2017 to the time that we submitted to EMA for the second time, several other studies had been completed. That gave us reason to believe the real world evidence. This is the first example of real world evidence that was used to support approval of a new medication in Europe for a disease that is not rare or not considered to have a high unmet need. So the key takeaway is real world evidence studies are not meant to replace randomized controlled trials. However, they can be used as supportive information when it's not feasible or ethical to do a randomized controlled trial. I highly suggest that you start your negotiations early on, and you engage your stakeholders, you follow the guidance from the regulators, um, and as always, just have transparency, register your study so it's clear to everyone you have a predefined hypothesis and analysis plan. If you have any additional questions, uh, feel free to connect with me.